So I'm very happy uh, to introduce uh, Matthew Morrow from JUSU, and he's going to tell us about a prismatic an analysis of uh, motivic cohomology. Uh, thanks very much for the introduction, Bhagav, and, uh, and many thanks to the organizers for asking me to speak at this, at this very special event. I start with a very short um, personal remark that my three years in Bonn with Peter were really a transformative experience. It changed the way I view and, and the way in which I try to do mathematics. Um, when he gave his, his ICM talk in 2018, the official ICM blog labeled him as the Jimi Hendrix of mathematics. And from that point of view, I can say that it's been an absolute pleasure to spend a little bit of time in the tour bus. So these, um, to turn now to the mathematics, these past few years have seen enormous progress in, in periodic cohomology culminating in, in the prismatic cohomology theory. And what I'd like to explain today is some, some offshoot in a slightly different and perhaps surprising direction and show how these developments can, depending on your point of view, we can either use them to analyze the existing theory of motivic cohomology that comes out of motivic homotopy theory, or we can use them to almost completely circumvent motivic homotopy theory and directly construct a good theory of A1 invariant motivic cohomology in a wide degree of generality. So this will, the, the main results I present today are joint with, with Tom Backman and Eldon Almanto, but the, the whole machinery depends very heavily on these, on these previous projects with Antio, Bat, Clausen, Kelly, Lourdes, Nicolas, and last but not least, Schultze. So before jumping straight into motivic cohomology in full generality, I, I'd like to focus on a special case of the theorem, which nevertheless not illustrates what's going to happen. And so we just need to, need to start with, with one definition that if, if A is an FP algebra, we have these classical motivic invariants given by the D log forms. So these are the omega of A log J, which are defined as follows. I just look at the, at the subgroup of differential forms. So the subgroup of omega J these are absolute differential forms of FP, which is generated, really I should say Zariski locally generated, but it's, it's, everything's gonna be sheafified in a second, so it doesn't matter, generated by things that look like DF1 over F1, wedge through DFJ over FJ, where these FIs run over units inside my ring. So for example, to tell you a few properties about this. So if A is regular and let's say local, then this, then omega one of A log is isomorphic on the nose to units mod P powers given by sending some F to f over f and so in general you should think if you haven't encountered these before you should think of these omega j logs as some tape twists of gm mod p so this as i said was is a, is a relatively classical invariant it was studied in the 80s, um, notably by, by Illusi, who was interested in its connection to crystalline cohomology, and by Milne, who was more interested in, from a motivic point of view, 
um, and for its role in special values of zeta functions. And what they cared about was its cohomology on smooth varieties. So that was typically the Zewiski or maybe the Atal cohomology of omega log j on some smooth variety. So I defined for you omega log j in the case of the case of some FP algebra, then you can sheafify it in whatever topology you want and take its cohomology. And these cohomology groups are then, as I've already mentioned, they're related to crystalline cohomology. And consequently, prismatic cohomology. Indeed, I'm going to use some properties of these, some, some results about these, about these omega j logs to, to, to simplify matters somewhat. But when one extends the, the, the theory into mixed characteristic, prismatic cohomology will play much more, a much more crucial role. So they're related to crystalline cohomology, motivic cohomology, as we'll see quite soon, K theory, and so on. If you're doing mod P cohomologies in characteristic P, these are what show up. Um, now I'm interested mainly today in, in a non-smooth non case. And in that case, there's the risk of the tower cohomology is not quite what you want to look at. Uh, so for non-smooth X, it's better to study the CDH cohomology. These R gamma and CDH of X with coefficients in omega J log. So let me, before stating the special case of the main result, since this CDH um, cohomology is going to appear time and time again in this talk, let me tell you what it is if you haven't seen it before. So this is the CDH topology uh, introduced by Vyvodsky to do motivic cohomology of, of non-smooth varieties. Um, so the definition starts with abstract blow-up squares. Uh, so an abstract blow-up square, it's a, it's a pullback square. And the idea is that we're going to, in the CDH topology, you allow blow-ups to be covers, uh, but it's convenient to allow things slightly more general than blow-ups. And these are the, the abstract blow-up squares. So it's a, it's a pullback square, say X prime, X double prime. That's a proper map. And I have some Y prime which is a finitely presented closed immersion. And then I have the, the pullback, y prime prime. And this proper map x prime prime over x prime is required to be an isomorphism outside of this specified closed subscheme. So for example, you can take X prime prime to be the blow up of X prime along Y prime. And in fact, up to various formal reductions, that's really the only case that the one needs to care about. And then the CDH topology on, we might as well define it on all quasi-compact, quasi-separated schemes because we'll need it in that degree of generality later, um, is generated by the Nisnevich topology plus covers coming from these blow-ups. 
So x prime prime onto x and y prime into, excuse me, into x prime. I declare that to be a cover for all abstract blobs. So morally, the point of this topology, which is why Vygotsky introduced it, is that any x, okay, I shouldn't say any x, uh, what's, what's the correct hypothesis, any quasi-excellent x or, or something like that, um, is regular locally in the CDH topology if you believe in resolution of singularity. But regardless of whether we believe resolution of singularities, we, we don't allow ourselves to use it, uh, especially, in, especially in mixed characteristics. And that's in fact what makes this CDH, CDH core model a little bit tricky, a little bit tricky to study. Um, so why would one be interested in fact in this, in this CDH cohomology of, of omega log? It's because you can, there was already good reason, I suppose, 20 years ago to, to predict that it provides some reasonable mod P motivic cohomology in characteristic P. So that's the idea. So this CDH cohomology with coefficients in omega j log is somehow it's an ad hoc guess, but a very reasonable one. For mod p motivic cohomology. Now I'm back to the case in which x is, is defined over fp. And therefore, the following result is not surprising. So this is the special case of the type of result that I want to discuss today. It is a one invariant. That is to say, say for any quasi-compact, quasi-separated FP scheme, The CDH cohomology of omega j log is the same as the cohomology on the affine line over R scheme. Um, so, what 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 immediately makes it a little bit a little bit counterintuitive, perhaps, is that so the left side has got something to do with blow ups of x, the right side is to do with blow ups of the affine line over x. And these are of course very far from one another. Nevertheless, nevertheless, the one can prove this theorem quickly if one allows resolution of singularities. You go as follows. Assuming resolution of singularities, you can immediately reduce to the case in which X is smooth. That's, that's the point of CDH cohomology. And you can moreover, I guess you need a little bit more than resolution of singularities. You would need strong form of resolution of singularities and some, some, some argument of Vygotsky on a, the now smooth scheme X, you would be able to replace the CDH cohomology by the Zariski cohomology. And so now you're in the context that you're trying to prove that the Zariski cohomology of something on a smooth scheme is A1 invariant. And at that point, Vygotsky's machinery of pre sheaves with transfer takes over and establishes the result for you. But what we're going to see is that we can firstly avoid resolution of singularities and that we can bypass any machinery of pre sheaves with transfer by instead taking advantage of these developments in recent years in piadic cohomology 
and things like the arc topology and its, and its further refinements. So somewhere, it's very curious, somewhere hiding in all these developments are tools to both overcome resolution of singularities. This is in fact perhaps not so surprising because what's going to happen is that these, we now understand periodic cohomology much better in terms of derived Duran cohomology in the cotangent complex. And there were results of GABA and GABA Romero saying that the cotangent complex behaves as though we know resolution of singularities. So that would be the key technique to avoid resolution of singularities. But we're also somehow going to establish A1 invariance of the resulting theory, which came as somewhat of a surprise, at least to me, because I think that basically none of the cohomology theories contained in the stream of recent developments are A1 invariant. Nevertheless. So that, as I say, is just a special case of, of what I want to talk about today. And the main theorem then is some more general results, say, but some, some results of a similar flavor, uh, but for motivic cohomology in general. That is to say both uh, with integral coefficients rather than mod p coefficients and, and even in mixed characteristic. But I'd like first try to get us all on the same page by, by spending a little bit of time just discussing the, the classical and say case of motivic cohomology in the context of, of smooth algebraic varieties. Um, so for me, the story starts with K theory. So let's suppose we've got R is any ring. Okay, I say any, I, I mean commutative. Um, or we could take some scheme X as we're typically going to do today. And then we associate to that its algebraic K theory. K of X. So this is depending on the degree of coherence you want, this is either a space or a spectrum in the sense of algebraic topology, um, whose homotopy groups are, are, are the so-called K groups. Say so KJ of X, KJ and Z. Um, and so despite the fact that we've had algebraic K theory and the K groups since 1973, uh, there's still a lot of open questions. I mean, perhaps the most fundamental one of which is, is Bass's finite generation conjecture that, oh, sorry, my R has become a, my R became an X as I knew it would. If R is a, is a finitely generated, if R is regular and finitely generated over the integers, then one predicts that these, that these K groups, which are just abelian groups, should be finitely generated. So this includes, for example, finite generation, the class group and the unit group of the ring of integers of a number field. But, but this is but in the generality of the high K groups, this is, this is wildly, wildly open. Um, but one can continue the list of, of open conjectures. So the point of motivic cohomology is then to break it, break it up, let's say, into easier or to be more precise, more, more geometric, or more cohomological pieces. And so to state what we know, as I say, is the existence of motivic cohomology 
primarily due to to Vyvodsky, but with, with fundamental work. We can say block Geyser because I'm particularly interested in what happens in characteristic P, Levine, Suslin, and others. Um, as was, but this is proving the conjectures from the 80s are Balenson, Lichtenbaum, and I'm going to add Milne because that's the first place I find the explicit conjectures and characteristic P. And they say exactly that, that we can refine, we can refine the algebraic K theory by more, by more cohomological invariance. Um, so for X, a smooth variety of a field, its K theory K of X can be refined in a sense that I'll make precise in a moment by a theory of this so-called motivic cohomology. Which consists of cohomologies of various weights, various positive weights, where the ZJXs are just some complexes of abelian groups. And then what does it mean that K theory is refined by these complexes or by the by the by the cohomology theory? Means to be precise, the K theory can be filtered. It admits a filtration, which we can then call the motivic filtration, with graded pieces given by these complexes, rather more precisely given by certain shifts of these complexes. And then by the usual spectral sequence associated to a, to a filtered gadget, you get the so-called Atia Hertzer book spectral sequence. Which looks like E2 IJ come just H I minus J and X Z minus J. So this being shorthand for the the cohomology of these complexes and converges to Ki minus J of X. So this is the sense in which the motivic cohomology groups refine, refine the K groups. You have this, this nice spectral sequence describing K theory in terms of motivic cohomology. As it stands, this is not very useful we need to justify that motivic cohomology is, is, is more accessible than, than K theory. Um, and so what are some properties of, of motivic cohomology in this context? Firstly, in, in weight one, it's just given by the cohomology of GM. And then there are three comparison results telling, telling you more about how they look. So firstly, the atiyah hertzberg book spectral sequence that I drew a moment ago degenerates rationally. And therefore, ra rational structure of motivic cohomology is more or less the same as rational structure of K-theory. And so next we want to describe it with finite coefficients. So if L is a prime invertible on X, then motivic cohomology modulo L is just given by the Atal cohomology with coefficients in the J Tate twist of mu L that's in degrees up to J.
and for P, the next comparison tells us what happens at the characteristic. So for P of prime, which is zero on X, well, that is just to say it's the characteristic of the base field. If I look at motivic cohomology mod P, then, aha, I get the cohomology, the Zewiski cohomology of these sheaves that I introduced at the beginning, these omega log sheaves. Shifted a little bit to the right. And that was the reason that one was interested in them from a, from a motivic point of view. And then there were, so those, as I say, are the comparisons. Two tells you how motivic cohomology looks rationally in terms of K theory, and three and four tell you that motivic cohomology with finite coefficients is governed by more accessible cohomology theories, cohomology that we know and love. And then, of course, there are various structural properties that, that were established that I, I'm not going to list all of. Um, one of them, I mean, Zewiski descent and some Gersten tells you that, that the result in, in part three is sufficient to describe all of the motivic cohomology mod L. As I've stated, it's only describing it up to degrees J, but then in fact, the rest is, is also determined by a tau cohomology. So the only structural property that I, I want to explicitly state is that of A1 invariance. Is that? is really going to be the focus of what I want to say today. So namely, motivic cohomology of X is the same as motivic cohomology of the affine line over X. So that's the, I, I, I admit various other properties that, that, that one does know because it would just complicate matters. This, this is somehow a simple presentation of the, of the key properties. Um, now this treats, so this gives us theory in, in the general, as I said, of smooth varieties over a field, um, but life is a little better than that. Certainly for smooth schemes over a dedicant domain, we have a pretty similar picture. Some results are only partial, but, but still life is pretty good. Um, we would expect similar results for any regular scheme. That's the generality in which some of the of the classical literature, in particular, some of the papers of Balenson, conjecture the existence of motivic cohomology. But we're going to go even further. We're going to go beyond any any regularity assumptions. Because in fact, as, as long as one slightly modifies the problem, it becomes a very reasonable study in, in the non-regular case. But as I say, to, to do that, um, one has to slightly modify the problem by replacing K theory by see, the problem being that once we go beyond the regular case, K theory fails to be A1 invariant. And so you could never hope to produce an A1 invariant motivic cohomology theory describing it. So we start by forcing K theory to be A1 invariant. And that's, a, that's, an, that's an old construction. Um, so let me say that in almost all work, that are now developing approaches to motivic cohomology um, that don't rely on any, on any A1 invariants, but everything, I, uh, most work, including what I, what I say today is in the A1 invariant context. So almost all work on motivic cohomology, um, say for, for non-regular or not necessarily regular. 
x, uh, we should immediately off the bat should replace the k theorem of x, which is what we're trying to refine by this construction introduced by, by Chuck Weibel, Weibel's A1 invariant k theorem, kh of x. And what's going to be important is that there are two, there are two points of view on, on KH theory. And it's, it's, it's completely mysterious to me still why, why these points of view agree. Um, so the first of these is Weibel's original definition and states that we define the KH theory of a scheme by forcing it to be, be A1 invariant. So we just formally stick together the K theory of all, of all affine spaces over it. So we take the totalization of the simplicial gadget, as I say, by patching together the K theory of all dimensional affine spaces over x uh, to fit this into a simplicial to a simplicial object one should take a little bit of care to rewrite the right hand side really using Susan's complex but if you if you've seen it before you know that if you if you've not seen it before I hope that nevertheless indicates the idea that it just formally patches together k theory this construction is nothing special to do with k theory you can take any 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 function any cohomology theory and universally force it to be a1 invariant by patching together the, its value on all dimensional affine spaces. And it produces, as I say, it would work for any cohomology theory, uh, produces the minimal or the, the universal modification of K theory, which is now A1 invariant. Which is a property, of course, that, that I should have made this explicit, that, that K theory fails to have outside the regular case. So that also means that in the regular case, we haven't done anything. So KH of X is the same as the K theory of X. If X is regular. Or in fact, if X is, for example, smooth over evaluation ring or some other cases. In fact, the, the degree of generality in which K theory is A1 invariant is, is not very clear. But in any case, in the regular case, if we produce motivic invariants related to KH theory, then we've really produced them related to K theory because, 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 they, because they agree. So this is, I say, this is, the original point of view on, on KH theory and, and how it was constructed. But then we have this second point of view encoded in a theorem due to Hessemeyer for varieties in characteristic zero, heavily using resolution of singularities. But then Szynski, in general, using stable homotopy theory, and reproved by Hertzstrung Tema using derived algebraic geometry. And it states that I can think of, of this A1 invariant K theory as being the CDH sheafification of K theory. So what does, what does the CD, CDH sheafification mean in this case? So, so, okay, so I define the CDH topology and we can ask whether K theory satisfies descent in it. It drastically fails to because it doesn't behave well. K theory does not behave particularly well with respect to blowups. Um, so to, just to summarize the situation, what we can do, we've got K theory. It doesn't behave very well with respect to blowups but we can somehow force it to, and that's by, by CDH sheafifying. 
So we force good behavior with respect to blow ups. And this, this theorem states that the result is, is KH. But then, okay, I mean, the original definition of KH was by forcing A1 invariance. And what's, what, as I say, is still somehow very mysterious to me is that the result of these two processes are the same. I mean, blow ups have nothing to do with A1 invariance, A priori, right? And yet, by forcing good behavior with respect to either of these, you end up in the same place. So this is really, I mean, this is somehow a big surprise, and it's, it's nevertheless going to be very important for, for, what's, for what's happening. Because this A1 invariance point of view is what's really central to most developments in, in motivic cohomology, particularly motivic homotopy theory. That's oh, as developed by Morel Vevodsky, Ayub, Szynski, Degelis, and others. But we're going to adopt a different point of view. We're going to systematically use CDH methods. So we're going to start over on this side of the picture and prioritize CDH methods. And then here comes the, the prismatic stuff. And we're going to use prismatic methods to check A1 invariance. Because if we construct something from motivic, excuse me, if we construct something from CDH cohomology, okay, we have this phenomenon with algebraic K theory that when we force good behavior, when we force CDH descent, somehow it automatically satisfies A1 invariance. But we don't, we, okay, because of techniques coming from stable homotopy theory. If we use some CDH cohomology to give ad hoc definitions, seemingly ad hoc definitions of motivic cohomology, based, for example, on, on symptomic cohomology or these omega j logs, then there's no a priori reason to expect that the output is going to be A1 invariant. And to prove that A1 invariance, we use prismatic cohomology. So let me now state what's really the main theorem, putting the, summarizing our constructions. So for X, any quasi-compact, quasi-separated scheme, we're going to produce a good theory of motivic cohomology, refining its a1 invariant K theory, and which compares correctly to all expectations. So KH of X may be refined. And here, I, when I say refined, it's in the same sense as previously. I, I've got a filtration on KH and I get a corresponding, a Tia Hertzer book spectral sequence. So I'm gonna refine it by a theory of, I should just call it motivic cohomology, but let me call it CDH motivic cohomology. Because we construct it using these CDH methods, ZJ, CDH of X for J bigger than or equal to zero um, with the following properties. So 
So, so Mr. Zero's property is that it compares correctly to what to Vygotsky's theory when such a comparison makes sense. So if X happens to be smooth over a field, then this CDH motivic cohomology is just the, the motivic cohomology that I, uh, I summarized in the previous theorem. And let me now start to give analogs of what we saw in the of what we saw in that theorem. So in weight one, we now get instead of the Zariski cohomology of GM, which we, we wouldn't 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 be big enough in general in the singular case, we pick up the CDH cohomology of GM. Uh, next, as in the smooth case, okay, the Atiyah-Hertzberg spectral sequence degenerates rationally. So the rational structure of the motivic homology is just controlled by K-theory. And so now the remaining, remaining results are going to describe what happens um, with finite coefficients. So firstly, for L a prime, which is invertible on X, we again have the motivic cohomology mod L, but we have the same as before. We just get the tau cohomology with coefficients in the J Tate twist of mu L. And again, that's just in degrees at most J. At the, the residue characteristic, if such a thing exists. So for P prime uh, equal to zero on X, so if I'm an FP scheme, then mod P motivic cohomology is now, previously it was the Zariski cohomology of these omega J log sheaves now we pick up the CDH analog, then the, the, the CDH cohomology. But now we're no longer over a field. And indeed, what we're really interested in is the mixed characteristic case. So I, I'm going to give you some. So we need another comparison theorem that describes what happens in mixed characteristic when there are residue characteristic P's floating around. So for P prime, in fact, this comparison subsumed is going to subsume three and four. So if I have some prime number, which is neither zero, okay, not, it's for any prime. Uh, I mean, I want to say for P not necessarily zero or invertible, uh, which means it's, it's any prime. We can describe the mod P motivic cohomology as follows. So it's given in degrees less than or equal to J. This is this phenomenon we, we always expect from, from, from the Bellens and Lichtenbaum philosophy. Degrees at most J by the CDH cohomology of the following. So it's a long sentence, but it's easier than actually writing down writing down the, the, the mathematical symbol. So I'm going to take the CDH cohomology of the following symptomic complexes. Oh, let me make sure it's a definition. Maybe I keep it blue. Um, so I've got my X. And I'm going to define some symptomic complex for each affine over X. 
And then I patch these together and I can take the, the CDH cohomology of the result. And this is what we'll be describing our, our mod P motivic cohomology. So what's the, syn what's the symptomic cohomology theory that I associate to some, some affine over X? Let me call this Z, let me call it FP in fact, because it's only gonna do more P coefficients. So this is FPJ symptomic of R, which is defined. Okay, so the very, let me, okay, let me, let me write down a definition. Um, I'm going to pull back a couple of things. So the most important contribution is this symptomic cohomology of its P completion uh, in, in the sense of second joint project with Bat and Schultz. Namely, these are the filtered Frobenius eigenspaces of the absolute prismatic cohomology of the p-complete ring R hat. This is known to admit a map by arc descent to the piadic et al cohomology of the generic fiber, which in turn is of course going to receive a map from the piadic et al cohomology without P completing. And so in this way, I, I pull back the piadic et al cohomologies, the BMS2 style syntomic cohomology of the completion to produce some sort of syntomic cohomology theory for my general ring R. And this, uh, I guess, is a construction that um, Akhil Matthew will also talk about, maybe with a different definition. There are various ways you can access this, this, this gadget. Um, but this is uh, a good theory of symptomic cohomology for, for general rings, for general rings R. And so we take the, as I say, the, the symptomic. So we take this, we take the we truncate the CDH cohomology of, of this symptomic cohomology. And this, of course, down at the bottom of the diagram, I should have entered, I should have, should have emphasized, is that this is the key place where prismatic cohomology enters. See, with mod P for any P, the key contributions coming into our motivic cohomology are some piece of ital cohomology, which is understood reasonably well, and this symptomic cohomology from, from the completion, which we then can control using prismatic techniques. So, and finally, uh, since I have to make a confession, I'd like to say that we have A1 invariance in full generality, because I'm supposed to be defining motivic cohomology, refining A1 invariant K theory. So we certainly expect it to be A1 invariant itself. But for the moment, we can only prove this uh, either if X, if X lies either a field or the ring of integers of a perfectoid field. Where on earth does that hypothesis come from? Um, so as I've been emphasizing, I mean, the arguments pass through prismatic cohomology at some point. Um, and in, in particular, to check the A1 invariance of our construction, um, 
we need some control over the prismatic cohomology of valuation rings. Because valuation rings are what give you the local rings in the CDH topology. So to make some CDH local arguments, we need to analyze prismatic cohomology of valuation rings. Um, now, if V is a valuation ring over FP, then this, the results we need follow some, some, some joint work with Shane Kelly. If V contains the ring of integers of a perfectoid field, then we can use, so then a student of mine, Vincent Bouy, um, has a generalization of what I did with Kelly in mixed characteristic, which can be combined with the work that Akil Matthew will be discussing on Friday uh, to again carry out the necessary analysis. But if V is arbitrary, just some random, well, I guess a, a random, you need to treat the case of rank one P complete valuation rings, uh, then there's still work to do. Which I'm confident can be done, but which which at present which at present is not. Hence the hence the, the ugly hypothesis. So to summarize, we produce this candidate theory of motivic cohomology, which is a one invariant modulo this this modular this hypothesis at the end, they want a variant in reasonable degree of generality, but not yet in full generality, refines a one invariant K theory, compares correctly to Vyrodsky, and is described with finite coefficients, either in terms of a tau or symptomic cohomology, which is what the, the original conjectures from the, from the 80s predict indeed one, one you can track down in an explicit conjecture in one of Milne's papers that even in mixed that in mixed characteristic, one would like the motivic cohomology with, with with mod p coefficients to be to be symptomically described. That was in, in the general that was in the smooth case, and here we have somewhat of, a, of an extension to the, to the case of general schemes. Um, and now, of course, I should make some remark because there do exist approaches. I mean, there exists stable homotopy theory already, um, which produces also candidate motivic cohomology theories. And from that point of view, one can instead view the theorem um, as a description of the motivic cohomology coming from coming from coming from coming from motivic homotopy theory. The motivic cohomology, let's say, and the slice filtration. coming from motivic homotopy theory. So if you allow yourself motivic homotopy theory, then as I say, this describes both aladically and piadically the motivic cohomology theory which is produced, but alternatively it can be used to almost entirely bypass motivic homotopy theory and directly construct um, motivic cohomology. So since I have, have five minutes left, if I'm not mistaken, I like to try to give a very quick sketch of the special case 
of the film that I stated at the beginning. Well, tell you what, let me let me let me jump into the sketch. So, outline of the sketch of the ideas of the proof. Uh, and just in, in characteristic P for mod P, mod P coefficients. So we stick to mod P coefficients uh, on some FP scheme X. Uh, so in this case, in fact, it's, it's easy to produce the, the filtration that one wants. So we combine the following facts. We combine the fact that KH uh, is given by the CDH chiefification of K theory, which is this table I quoted earlier, um, that CDH local wings are certain valuation rings uh, over FP, and the fact that we can describe the K-theory of such valuation rings. So again, let me work with mod P coefficients. Then one knows that the K-theory of a, of a valuation ring in characteristic P with mod P coefficients, okay, they vanish if J is negative. That's not the interesting part. In positive degrees, they're given by these log forms. So this, as I, as, I, as I already alluded to earlier, this is some, some, some joint work with Shane Kelly, but I, I tried to chase a little bit everything that we use and it's quite extensive. So certainly one needs this rigidity result proved with Clausen and Matthew, but that in turn uses the new approach to topological cyclic homology developed by Nicolaus and Schultze, um, and the description of topological cyclic homology in this type of context, which requires you to control it using derived Duran methods. So it should include the second collaboration with Bat and Schultze. I just want to indicate how, in fact, I, in the, the, the very end of the talk, I can indicate a little bit how how, um, how Schultz's work contributes I mean, in a fundamental way to this. So once we've got this description, and in this description of KPO evaluation, I mean, it's, I mean, it's, it, it's astonishing. I mean, both sides have existed since the 80s, but to establish the isomorphism, you really need to use uh, high-powered machinery coming from periodic cohomology. Uh, and so from these, from these properties, since we understand K-theory as a sheafification and we understand it CDH locally, um, so we get a descent filtration on KH of X with graded given by the CDH cohomology on X with coefficients in these various omega log Js. So these are the gadgets that appeared way back in the, in the first theorem. Oh, okay, I should be careful, so it needs to be shifted. And so the core content of the theorem is then checking that this construction is, is A1 invariant. So that it actually looks like motivic cohomology. And that's what as I said. That's what I stated in the first in the first term. And so, so to do that, the first step is you check it is you check that it's a CD arc sheaf. Where here we use this refinement of uh, the CDH topology developed by Almento, 
for your uh, Iwasa and Yakasan, which is itself oh, based it's on. Oh, sorry, sorry, I'm sorry. I always make mistakes with these long lists. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and can get the paper. This is, of course, itself based on the arc topology of Bat Matthew, which is itself I mean, strongly inspired by the V topology of Bat Schultz in the affine, in the width vector affine Grassmannian paper. And therefore, using this CD arc sheafiness, we may assume that V is spec V can reduce to the case where X is just the spectrum of a valuation ring, not just any old valuation ring, but a rank one valuation ring. And so now the CDH dimension of the affine line over V is at most two. And so the descent spectral sequence coming from the CDH cohomology with coefficients in omega j log and converging to the kh theory has only three columns, which is not quite enough to tell you that it automatically degenerates, but it's not far from it. And so one then manages to check by hand that it degenerates. And then you conclude from using the fact that the KH theory of V of T is just the same as the KH theory of V. In other words, you manage to perform one of these rare arguments where you can argue backwards in your spectral sequence, knowing something about what it converges to, to get something about what's going on on the E2 page. And what's really, really crucial is that the spectral sequence is not very big because the CDH cohomological dimension of V of T is at most two, which ultimately traces back to the fact that you've got these CD arc methods, which have their birth somewhere way back in the V topology. Bat and Schultz. So, I mean, it's astonishing how much goes into this to bypass, as I say, it's not we, to prove this type of result, we bypassed the resolution of singularities and proved A1 invariance through what still seemed to me to be quite, quite surprising techniques. So, that's the very brief sketch of how one checks A1 invariance properties for mod P cohomology and characteristic P. And to push through such arguments in the generality of the theorem, namely in, in mixed characteristic, one has to carry out similar arguments for this syntonic cohomology theory arising as the filter for penis eigenspaces of prismatic cohomology. I'll finish there. Thank you very much. Ah, wonderful. Thanks for the fantastic talk. Uh, are there questions for Matthew? Uh, yes, great talk. Uh, Thank you. Thanks, Peter. Hi, Peter. <laughs> hi. <laughs> uh, I had a few questions. Uh, for the technical question, uh, the spectral sequence doesn't always converge, does it? That here hurts the spectral sequence. No, no, so you better assume that you're finite valuative dimension. Okay. Um, yeah, but, uh, I mean, in a scheme um, that well, doesn't have finite valuative dimension, I don't want to, no, no, but as long as you're finite valuative dimension, that's fine. Another technical question and then a more real question. Um, I guess it's known that locally in the CDH topology, uh, you are a local complete intersection, right? Is that true? 
not in mix. I mean, from the cotangent complex looks like your local complete intersection, which is what Gabo Romero tells. Ah. But I, uh, I mean, I. So, so our valuation, no. is, is, is it not? Ah, it's, I guess it's not even known that any valuation ring is like in locally complete intersection. No, no, ah. no, no. Ah. All right, but Gabo Romero proves that the cotangent complex. Yeah, to, yeah, but it's, it's, it was. It kind of pretends it is. It's just it's just it's got tall amplitude between zero and one. But that's not it's not quite enough because there's lots of other things that also have tall amplitude just in zero and one. Oh no, I mean it looks quasi symptomic. Okay, and then a the philosophical question, I got a bit confused. So there are like several different kinds of motivic cohomologies corresponding to several kinds of different K series. So there should also be like these other motivic cohomologies that correspond to usual K series. I guess well, there should be. I don't know. The, the, but I, I mean, guess but there then are some there of us who be... believe that, and maybe some of us who don't. Okay. Uh, but uh, <laughs> there should also be those that correspond to G theory, right? And how, how is G theory oh. related to K theory? Is it the same? Or? Sorry. No, no. I mean, G theory, it's functionality goes the wrong direction. All right. So if you care about G theory, then you really want some sort of motivic homology theory, oh. which. At least over fields, that's that's fine. That exists, and again, I think even for things that were dedicated domains, that's constructed. Because that's the setting where the usual, also the usual old motivic homotopy theory techniques apply. Do they? Or how does it work? Well, uh, so the Bloch-Levine complex of higher cycles defines for you Borel more homology theory on on singular varieties. But I don't believe that one has any reasonable motivic homology theory for the G corresponding to the G theory of an arbitrary scheme. Mm -hmm. no, no, not as far as I'm aware. Mm -hmm. It's true that, yeah, right, G, and so G theory is also a homotopy in vain, but it doesn't have the right functoriality to, to, mm -hmm. to compare uh, to KH. Okay, yeah. That's, okay yeah. I think the functoriality. Right, so for, for cohomology, for A1 invariant, motivic cohomology comparison to KH is the, is the right thing. Okay, great. That's it from my side. <laughs> yeah, thanks very much. <laughs> Are there other questions? I have a short notational question. So just right now in point three, when it's, you say it's an equivalence in degrees smaller equal j. So yeah. what does degrees smaller equal j mean? So is it I mean, an equivalence? Like, I, I, I just can't pass the notation. Like what this okay, means. so I, I mean, I guess if I mean, if I, if I truncate both things in degrees less than j, it's an equivalence. Oh, okay, okay, that makes sense. But the left-hand side is also CDH locally supported in degrees less than j. Okay. So then by CDH descent, it forces the structure of the whole left hand side. On. I should really say, I mean, if you, if you, I mean, I should really say if one wants to give the correct, I was trying to avoid these sorts of messy expressions, but I should really say that it's CDH cohomology on X of the truncation below J of R epsilon lower star of mu L tensor J where epsilon is projection from a tau to Zariski topology. I mean, that's the full description of the left-hand side. And then one uses even H descent for a tau cohomology to observe that this isn't changing the tau cohomology in degrees up to J. So the precise answer to your question is that it's an equivalence after truncating in degrees less than J. The, the, the better answer to your question is that in fact, that then forces on you a complete description of the left side in terms of a tau cohomology. Okay, thanks. Can, can I ask a question about, uh, so if you have a regular, so if you have a regular- I hear, I hear really badly. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I hear really badly. I think your connection is, but go, go ahead, go ahead. So I, I can type in the chat if that's better. I, um, no, I hear it okay. I hear it okay. So try. I'll let you know if I miss anything. Uh, so then you're constructing a filtration on, on the filtration, and I was wondering if it's related to the cycle complexes. So you want? Let me see if I let me see if I caught everything because I only got every other word. I'm taking a regular scheme 
and then indeed this produces some filtration on on produces some motivic cohomology filtering the k theory and so i can try to compare it to block cycle complex is that the question so comparison with cycle complexes yes uh, okay so if i'm over a field yes that's point zero so let me now take regular scheme, which is finite type over a dedicated domain. Then the answer is no. I mean, the answer is no, the answer is I don't know. The answer is I don't know. The, but the, 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 this is almost, this is in fact related to Peter's question because what's known on, because what's known on a general schemes of finite type over a dedicated domain is that the, the block levine cycle complex defines for you the correct theory of borel moore homology. Um, and so then indeed in the regular case, you could guess that it's defining the correct theory of motivic cohomology, but it's not even known to be functorial. So if you take a map between regular schemes of finite type over Z, it's not known that you have functor cohomological functoriality of the, of the block Levine cycle complex. There are these very, very fundamental problems about it um, that would seem to make it very difficult to establish to establish a comparison with this. I, I think ultimate, ultimately one should hope for such a comparison, but I, I suspect it's a very difficult question because the, because the block Levine cycle complex is not really that well understood on regular schemes. I mean, All right. Uh, but sorry. your theorem does give a, in the regular case, it does give an answer. I mean, you just you said it somewhere in the beginning that in the regular case, you expect a similar filtration and your theorem does give such. Sure, it gives such a filtration, it gives such a filtration, um, but you can... Okay, so you can stick to the smooth case. Right, okay, so my, my co-author Tom is telling me that smooth over dedicated is fine, but I disagree with this. We've not yet managed to establish that if I take something smooth over a dedicated domain, that our construction agrees with the block Levine cycle complex. Ah, no, we do have Gerst, right, because we don't have any Gersten machinery in that context. We use some dirty arguments at some point over fields that when you've got an A1 invariant theory, it automatically satisfies some Gersten style block ogre's resolution, which lets you reduce certain assertions to fields. And that machinery is not available in mixed characteristic. So that's the sort of piece of the puzzle which is currently missing. For something smooth over a dedicated domain, we can't come, we, the moment we don't know that our construction is the same as as the block of cycle complex. All right, I'm going to interject <laughs> and let declare sure. that maybe we should stop because Kastuda's talk yeah, is supposed sure, to start sure, in sure. less than two minutes, or one minute. Uh, but maybe, okay, so let's thank Matthew again.